was doing great and wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue and the freedmen, as it was also called, and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and the Cilians and, and those from Cilia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard from him speak blasphemy, words against Moses and God. And they stirred up in the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witness, witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Yet the Most High does not dwell in the houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Do not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So we're continuing through our walk through the book of Acts, but there's a, a, a turn that happens here at this point in the book where Luke has turned his attention uh, away from specifically how God was working among the apostles. And you're going to see now, Luke is going to introduce some new characters, if you will, some new men into the story. And he's going to highlight how God worked in each of their lives. And I'm really thankful that he did. Because if we only read Acts to this point, we might be tempted to believe that God works through apostles, right? I mean, God commissioned the apostles. He told them in Acts 1.8, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And, and man, it happened. The apostles had stood firm in the face of persecution. They preached boldly uh, before the rulers and authorities, the scribes, the Pharisees, the whole Sanhedrin. They have been performing signs and miracles, and God has been doing extraordinary things. And if we just stopped here, we might think, man, and those apostles, if we had one of those today, and if God would just, you know, send an apostle, Peter, Paul, one of those guys today, then, man, it would just be remarkable about what he could do in our midst. And can we just maybe indulge for a minute? Y'all, can we just imagine what would happen in our city if Peter and John showed up? Man, they're preaching here on Sundays and they're living out there throughout the rest of the week. They're standing on the courthouse lawn or wherever they would have had an opportunity to preach. They're performing signs and wonder, wonders. They're making rounds through the hospitals. I mean, they're, they're doing these miraculous things. Like, imagine what would happen in our city if someone with that boldness and that power and that, that relationship with Christ, if somebody like that lived in our city, imagine what could happen. The reason I like this turn in the book of Acts here is you're going to see that the, the power and the presence of God did not stay with just the apostles, but it went out to all of God's people. So read with me here in Acts chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 8. And we see the man Stephen. You heard about him last week. Stephen was the guy that they thought, hey, we need someone to wait on tables and to oversee distribution of food to the widows. So let's find some men full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, uh, someone who can serve well, and let's appoint them to the task. And so Stephen, uh, he was numbered among what are probably the earliest deacons. He was a servant of God. And you, you might think, you know, okay, I mean, Stephen was obviously a new believer. He wasn't one of the 12 who walked and talked with Jesus, right? He wasn't a disciple by Christ himself, but he'd come to faith rather recently. 
And he, he probably, you know, if you've, you have a firm commitment to the Lord and you know some scripture and you have the Holy Spirit, well, yeah, you can serve as a servant, a, a deacon, right? But you're going to see that God chose to use a man, an ordinary guy who hadn't been a believer for very long. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he used him to be the first martyr in his church. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't James, it wasn't John. It was a man named Stephen who was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. So here, here it is in verse 8. Stephen, full of grace and power. He wasn't just waiting on tables, y'all. He was performing great wonders and signs among the people. The power of God was at work in and through Stephen. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including the Cyrenians, Alexandrians, some from Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and they argued with Stephen. Now you might wonder, what in the world is the synagogue of the freedmen? Well, uh, if, if you know kind of the discussion last week between the Hebraic widows and the Grecian or the Hellenistic widows, um, there's a similar thing going on here. The synagogue of the freedmen would, would have consisted of men uh, either who had been enslaved themselves or they were the sons of former slaves who had been set free. That's why they're known as the freedmen, and they were Hellenistic. Probably by virtue of the fact that they weren't raised in uh, their native home or by their families, but rather would have been raised up uh, as slaves in a, another home, they probably never learned to speak Aramaic. They never learned all of the customs of the native Hebrews who were raised in a good Hebrew home. And so there was some tension between the, the Hebraic Jews and the, the Grecian Jews. And so uh, the, the Grecian Jews just decided, hey, we're going to have our own synagogue. Now, what had been happening for a while uh, would have been the, maybe the complaints among the native Hebrews that you're not Orthodox enough, you're not Jewish enough, you're not practicing the customs, you need to learn to speak Aramaic. There would have been tensions there, and yet here is Stephen. He's performing miraculous wonders and signs, and they choose to oppose him, probably because they didn't want to fall into uh, disrepute or out of favor with the Hebraic Jews and that synagogue. So these men, they rose up and they argued with Stephen. And they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Here, here are the charges they leveled against him. They secretly uh, induced men to say, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Stephen speaks against Moses, the law of Moses. That was the law that governed the everyday life of every good Jew at the time. Speaking against even God. But then they go on. And they stirred the people up, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the whole council. It's not just the synagogue of the freedmen anymore. Uh, they're gathering together the whole of the rulers and authorities in their day. And they put forth fa false witnesses who said, This man is incessantly speaks against this holy place. It would have been the temple they're referring to and the law. So they've spoken against Moses and his law. They've spoke, he's spoken against God and his temple. That's the charge they leveled against Stephen. We've heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Now, you're about to see in Acts chapter 7 uh, the longest sermon recorded in the book of Acts. And I wish that I could read all of that to you today, uh, but I would struggle, and you might struggle to follow along. So I'm going to do my best to summarize the sermon that Stephen preached to these men on this day. He gets the opportunity, just like Peter and John, to speak the gospel, to speak the truth to the rulers who were out to persecute him in this moment. And so what Stephen essentially does, just to kind of put it in a nutshell, is he tells about the redemptive work of God throughout the history of Israel. And so he's going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. Now, he could have gone back to Adam and Eve and recounted the fall that, you know, sin enters the world. And as a result, we were separated from God. But he picks up in Genesis chapter 12 when God calls a man named Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I want you to leave the land of your fathers and I want you to go wherever I'm going to tell you to go. Abraham, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. I'm going to make a great nation through you. I'm going to give you an inheritance. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people and your people are going to be marked by circumcision. Circumcision. 
That's how we're going to mark the people of Israel. You're going to follow after me. I'm going to be your God. It's going to be this wonderful relationship. Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you an inheritance. But there's one little thing that's going to happen. In a number of years, your people that are going to come from your line, your seed, they're going to be enslaved. But don't worry. I'm going to send a redeemer who's going to deliver the people out of slavery. So Stephen begins there. And then he begins to recount exactly how that happened. Abraham had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you've heard that uh, put together throughout the scriptures, the Jews would have said, these are our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, one of whom was named Joseph, and the rest of his brothers didn't like him very well, so they sold him into slavery in a place called Egypt. God, through his sovereign works, takes Joseph from a place of a servant in a household, ended up in prison for about a decade or so. He ultimately brings him to where he is one of the the highest rulers in all of Egypt. There's a huge famine in the land, and Joseph, because God had told him a famine was coming, he had prepared and he stored up grain. So Joseph finds himself in the position of being second only to Pharaoh in the kingdom. He stored up lots of grain, a famine hits, and his brothers who lived in Canaan, where they'd sold him from, they show up in Egypt needing grain. There's a beautiful reunion that takes place uh, where there is reconciliation that happens. Joseph brings his entire family from Canaan to live in Egypt They all have plenty. Life is good for the people of God. Generations happen. Babies are born. The Israelite people multiply. But then something happens. A king comes to power. Not only did he not know Joseph, he didn't know about Joseph and what he'd done. He didn't even know why these people were living in the land of Egypt. And so he decides to enslave them. And the people were enslaved in Egypt. They did forced labor. And the Pharaoh was hard on them. Their suffering became great. So God decides he's going to work. He's going to work his work of deliverance. And there's a baby born by the name of Moses to a Hebrew woman. He ends up being raised in the household of Pharaoh. He's learned and trained in all the ways of Pharaoh's household. He gets, you know, training that most people wouldn't have had. However, one day he's out for a walk or whatever he was doing, and he sees one of the Egyptians beating one of his fellow Hebrews. So he kills him. He does what any normal person... No, I'm kidding. He he did. He ends up killing the guy and having to flee the country. He flees to a, a place called Midian where God, 40 years later, appears to him in the burning bush incident. Y'all should be familiar with this if you've been around church for very long. God says to Moses, take off your shoes for where you're standing. It's holy ground. He calls Moses to go and to lead his people out of Egypt, and it absolutely happened. Moses goes and he tells Pharaoh to let my people go. That's a long story, but ultimately Pharaoh did. And the people of God, they are delivered from their bondage and slavery in Egypt. They walk across the Red Sea on dry land. They're out in the wilderness where God is going to feed them and provide for them. And you would think, this is the people of God. They're going to follow after him, but they didn't. They didn't listen to Moses. At times, their hearts long for the slavery of Egypt. And when Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, where God was giving the law that was ultimately going to be the, the, the law of the land for his people, They decide that, you know what, we're here in the wilderness. Moses is on the mountain. We don't know where God is. We can't see him. Let's fashion for ourselves a golden calf. And so God says, listen, I made a promise to Abraham. I was going to make a people for him, and I was going to give him an inheritance. So y'all just go ahead and go into the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you. But Moses interceded on their behalf, and God relents. God forgives, and he chooses to make his presence known by having Moses build a tabernacle. It was, uh, it was according to God's design, it was a tabernacle that they would take with them wherever they went in the wilderness. And by day, uh, God's presence, his glory would be uh, kind of, he would show them where to go by a cloud at night. It would be a pillar of fire and they would go wherever God would lead them. They would follow and they would move the tabernacle there. His glory rested within that tabernacle so they would know that's where God is. His glory is in that place. And then God finally leads his people into the promised land. 
They go and they're victorious over all the people there. Uh, David becomes king. He's a man after God's own heart. He wins these extraordinary victories for the nation of Israel. And he wants to build God, not this, this temporary dwelling place, the tabernacle which they had moved, but he wants to build God a temple a house. God said, hey, David, I'm, I'm going to do this through your line, but not through you. It's going to be Solomon. And so Solomon builds the temple. Now, if that's a mouthful, y'all, I summarized, all right? This was a, a long sermon in which Stephen, he went back before all of these Jews, before this religious council, and he's like, remember how God worked throughout our history? Do you remember how he led us out of slavery in Egypt and into the wilderness and ultimately brought us into the promised land? Remember the inheritance that God talked about, that he promised, the old covenant of circumcision. I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. And Stephen is, is, is basically given a really good Orthodox Jewish understanding of the work of God throughout history. And at this point in the sermon, everyone in the council probably would have been, would have been nodding like, yeah, that's what God did. Yeah, there was a time we turned away in the golden calf, but God, he, he relented and, and he chose to redeem us and continue to, to, to lead us as our God. They all would have been with him until you turn your Bibles to chapter 7, verse 48. Stephen begins to point out something that should have been obvious. He begins to quote Isaiah chapter 66, which they would have known. Now, they're angry with him for speaking against God and his temple, Moses and the law, but then he's going to point something out to him. Verse 48, he says, However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all of these things? I'm, I'm, I'm the God of the universe. The earth is my footstool. You think I dwell in this little bitty house made by human hands? And then he really turns up the temperature of the sermon. This is the point at which he gets red-faced and starts to spit maybe a bit. Uh, he begins to preach to the people. He says, you men who are stiff-necked. Now, this is a really, really important word. This is the word that God used to describe Israel when they had made the golden calf and they wouldn't be obedient to Moses. They were stiff-necked. And what Stephen is telling them is, hey, so are you. You're just like those people who turned against God. Those people that you've thought your entire life, like, why didn't they just follow God? He was clearly leading them. He was providing for them bread in the morning and quail. And they, like God had done all of these things. He provided water from a rock. There was miraculous works, and they turned away. And he said, you are like those people. That in the midst of all of God's extraordinary works, in the midst of miracles, in the midst of signs, in the midst of the provision of God, your hearts had turned away. You men are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. You might claim circumcision. I'm of the nation of Israel. I'm marked as God's person. And yet he says, your hearts haven't been transformed. Your ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just like your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by the angels, yet you did not keep it. It's like, hey, you lovers of the law, can you just be reminded that you don't keep it? Can we all agree about what the prophet said, that God doesn't live in the temple? Like that's not his house, he doesn't dwell there, it doesn't, he's not contained within the bounds of the temple? He begins to push back pretty hard against the religious rulers. And you're going to see they didn't take it so well. Verse 54, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and they covered their ears and they rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
and went on stoning Stephen as he, as, he call, as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. The Jews were very well acquainted with how God had worked throughout their history. Remember Abraham? He called him to leave in the land of his fathers, and he called him to a new place, and Abraham followed after God. Remember Isaac? Remember Jacob? Remember Joseph? Remember the deliverance from slavery in Egypt? Remember all that God had done? They were very well acquainted with how God had been working throughout their history, very well versed in what God had done in the past. But they were completely unaware that they had missed how God was working in their presence. They were so caught up in the old covenant of circumcision, of the law, the prophets, they were so caught up in what they knew of God that they failed to see that God was at work in their midst. The very men who had Stephen standing in their presence that day would have been there. They would have been rulers and authorities when God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. When God sent his son Jesus to live in their midst, in their day, they saw him. They would have heard him teaching at times in the temple. They would have heard about the miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus had performed. Jesus came. He made his dwelling among us and he fulfilled the law. And he lived a life of sinless perfection in their midst. They'd seen it. But they ultimately rejected Jesus. They crucified him on a cross. And there, as Jesus hung on a cross, he was making the atoning sacrifice for their sin. What Jesus was doing in the shedding of his blood on the cross was fulfilling the redemptive work that God had begun all the way back in Genesis. That God had had a plan from the very beginning, not that they would continue to have to follow after the law, but that the law would point them toward their desperate need for a Savior. Not that they would have to continue to offer sacrifices year after year after year after year for the forgiveness of sin, but that in the person of Jesus Christ, that one sacrifice once for all would be made for the sins of the entire world. God was performing his greatest work in their midst, and they missed it. And they knew the past so well. They knew the word. They knew the law. They knew the prophets, but they missed the Messiah. And when someone dared to point that out to them, they're enraged. They took stones in their hands and they threw them at Stephen, one after another, after another, after another, until he falls on his knees, echoing the words of Jesus, Father, forgive him. Don't hold this sin against them. And he dies. So here we are, a couple of thousand years removed from the stoning of a man named Stephen. He's a fairly new believer. An ordinary guy like you or me. But he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of faith. And God uses him to become the first martyr. So for us, what do we take away from this story, this sermon, which is rather lengthy? I want to make a few points for you, and then I want to you know, point out two things that I believe that we need to know um, from this text. The, the first thing was that in the Old Covenant, there was an outward mark that designated the people as the people of God. This was circumcision. This is the Old Covenant. 
in the new covenant, it's a covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ, and there's a new mark, and it's not outward circumcision, but rather it's circumcision of the heart, where we have been transformed, where we have died to our old selves just as Jesus died. Uh, we were crucified with Christ, and we've been raised to walk in a new life. And so our hearts have been transformed in the new covenant. It's not that we have the law and we've got to somehow work really, really hard to obey that law. It's that our hearts have been set free from the bondage of sin in the same way that Moses led the people out of bondage and slavery in Egypt. Jesus, the better, the new new deliverer led us out of slavery to sin. And now we're not slaves to sin anymore. We're free to live as, as righteous people. No longer do we look to the law to know how we should behave in every single situation, but God has sent his Holy Spirit to be our guide, a better guide than the law, a better deliverer than what we saw in Moses, a better covenant than what we had in Abraham. Oh, we live in better times. We live in more hopeful days where the fullness of God's work has been demonstrated in our midst. We get to read in the word about the work of Jesus Christ, and he didn't just do it for them, but he did it for us that our hearts might be set free and that we might be transformed. And so we have much to celebrate today. If I just closed the Bible and we prayed, we could be encouraged by the work of God for us today. There's hope for the world. Like, man, God has done extraordinary things for us. Because just like those people that stoned Stephen, our hearts were once hard. We too were once slaves to sin. We rebelled against God. All of the things that were true of them were at one point true of us. If you're here today and you've come to faith in Christ, you know that your heart's been set free. You know that you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't go to a temple to worship God and, and, and have a priest as our intermediary, but we get to pray to a holy God who now dwells within us. We have much to celebrate. But I believe that God has something more for us here. There are two things that I believe our church needs to hear. Two things I believe that you need to hear and embrace and take to the core of your being today that we can see from this text. The first thing is that God's presence is not limited to certain places. The Most High doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands. God lives in the heavens. He's not created like the rest of us. He doesn't have a beginning and an end. He's not contained within the created space, but rather he is God. He exists outside of creation. God's presence is not limited to certain places, and it's not limited to certain times. What I want you to hear today is that God is not done. Although the work of redemption has been accomplished on the cross, God is not done. And I believe that in people who are recipients of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have heard the words of the gospel it uttered into our ears and the Spirit has impressed our hearts and filled our hearts with faith, God is not done. He didn't quit 2,000 years ago, but he was building his church through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's still doing that work today. And I believe that we as a church have got to look ahead and say, our best days are ahead of us because God's not done. Like God is still doing the miraculous. And just like those people in the Old Testament, these men here who will always look back to the work of God, we can fall into that same rut and be like, hey, remember what God did back in the day? Remember in Acts when thousands of people came to faith in Jesus Christ and God, you know, used his church even in the midst of persecution and some wonderful things happened? And weren't those good days? How foolish would we be to forget that God's presence isn't limited to certain places. He doesn't dwell in houses made by human hands. He's not bound by time. God's still at work. And I believe that he wants to do a miraculous work in our midst. I was talking to my wife last night. She was talking about two men in her family that they were the ones that it wasn't happening. You know what I mean? Like it just wasn't going to happen for them. They, they weren't going to follow after Jesus. They had, you know, really difficult questions to anyone who would talk about Christ. 
And somehow, some way over the years, and through gospel proclamation, one of them was drunk when he came to faith in Jesus Christ. But somebody, somewhere, a believer in Jesus Christ had the audacity to believe that the work of God, that his presence wasn't contained back in biblical times. He doesn't live in a temple that they had to bring him to. It was in the midst of a party where a guy had too much to drink that they proclaimed the gospel message. And this man came to faith in Jesus Christ. And it is one of our, our deepest and dearest relationships now that they're believers in Jesus Christ and God has saved the, the man and he saved his father. People we thought would never come to faith in Christ. I wonder what would happen if we had the audacity to believe, to believe that God's presence is with us in the same way that he was present with his people in Acts, in the same way that he was present with Stephen. Do you remember what Jesus said with the Great Commission where he told us to go out and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? You know what he concluded that with? He said, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. The age isn't over, y'all. God is still with us. We still have an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to see the hopeless find hope in him. The person who's broken can receive healing. He's at work through us. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he wants to use us. Let me ask you this question. If you knew God was absolutely with you, then who would you tell the gospel to? If you knew that God was on your side and he was for you and he called you to this, who would you share the gospel with? And if you do indeed know that God's presence isn't limited to a temple that existed, honestly, it got torn down in AD 70, right? That it existed at one time and is no more, but God's presence isn't limited there. It's here that he's with us. Would you have the boldness to go and to share? To go and to serve, to go and to minister in the same way. God is with us. Stephen was just a man, but he was a faithful witness to the end because he knew that God was with him. In the end, he was anticipating God taking him to heaven, being with him. He saw Jesus at the right hand of God. He knew that this life wasn't all that there was, and so he was faithful to the end. So God's presence isn't limited to certain places. And the second thing I would want you to see is that God's power isn't limited to certain people. It was up to this point in the story that the apostles were the ones whom God was using to perform the miraculous signs and wonders. It was up to this point that they were the ones who were boldly testifying in the face of persecution. Now, this would make sense, wouldn't it? Because the apostles, they, they walked and talked with Jesus. They'd been sent out a couple of times. They'd cast out demons. They'd healed the sick before. For them, I mean, they were physically with Jesus. It would make sense that they would do it. And yet, we look at the life of Stephen, and we see that the power of God did not stop with the apostles. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told his disciples, I want you to wait for me in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the very ends of the earth. Do you remember what happened there in chapter 8, verse 1? It says that Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. That was Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The thousands of believers who had come to faith under the preaching of the apostles were scattered all throughout Judea and Samaria. The persecution was so great in Jerusalem that they had to flee. And that was all a part of God's plan. Because even though they couldn't go and gather in the temple anymore and listen to Peter and John preach anymore, even though they didn't get to have the, the great sermons and the great gatherings that they once had, all across Judea and Samaria they would gather in houses in small pockets of believers and they would speak the word to one another and they would pray together and they would demonstrate the power of God at work through them because this idea that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth, that wasn't just for the apostles. It was for all of God's people. And if it was true of them, it 
is true of us, that we have the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us. The power of God was not limited in certain people. It's with us. Those believers who were brand new, y'all, like Pentecost had just happened. They received the power of the Spirit. And even though they didn't have Peter and James to direct them anymore, or the rest of the apostles to preach to them and to guide them, they had the Holy Spirit of God. And so they would speak the word to each other, and they would be bold witnesses right where they were. Right where they were. And you know what happened after this persecution? The church exploded. It started in Jerusalem, and then went out into Judea, and then Samaria, and today we are witnesses that the gospel has gone to the ends of the earth. What if we believed that God's presence wasn't limited to a certain place at a certain time, and that his power wasn't limited to certain people, but rather his presence and his power are with us, that we can with the same boldness that we can with the same confidence, not in our flesh, not in our wit, not in our great understanding, but in the power of God, that we could be witnesses to the people around us. And wouldn't it be a tragedy if we were like the Jews in the story, always looking back to what God's done in the past? Y'all, I grew up in this church. I was saved and baptized in this church. I remember the day my mom got saved. I remember the day that my family members got saved here. I watched them be baptized. My children have been baptized here. Maybe you were baptized here. Here's what I want to say. God is not done. That God has greater and better things ahead for us as the people of God. So today my challenge to you is to acknowledge his presence, acknowledge his power in your life, and just dare to be bold as we leave this place today. Dare to be bold. You go to your workplace tomorrow, dare to be bold. Dare to trust in his power and his presence, not in your weakness. To be a witness. I want to ask you a question again. What would you attempt? Who would you share with? Who would you be a witness to if you knew that God was present with you and that his power was with you? And as you shared, it wouldn't be you, but it would be the Holy Spirit of God working through you. Like, Who would you want to see come to faith? And who's that impossible person in your life that you're like, they're never going to come to faith? It's time for the church to get busy again. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we pray that your power would be demonstrated within us today. God, would you bring our hearts to repentance for our what, what oftentimes comes out as apathy? God, we get so busy with the things of this world, with the, the goings-on of life that we forget that we're here to build your kingdom and that your word has told us that if we seek your kingdom first, all the things that we're concerned about will be added to us. God, I pray for the person that doesn't know you today, the person that's never trusted in you. Maybe they've been around church for a while. They've been hearing the sermons, but they never responded in faith. Today, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. God, that you would save here, and then as we scatter out all over this place, all over the city of, of Poto and the surrounding towns, the county of Lafleur, God, I pray that we would be your witnesses and that you would save there too. And I pray that people would be restored, that people would be healed, and that people would experience deliverance because we understand that the power and the presence of God are with us. God, may you work in us first and then work through us as we leave this place. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.